Hi, I'm Daniel, and before the episode starts, I want to briefly talk to you about the Garden Outreach Project, a WCF program focused on putting faith into action. Our mission is to inspire and support Christadelphians in North America to share Christ's love through outreach initiatives. This is done by facilitating national and local outreach activities, supplying resources, and providing funds to help brothers and sisters serve those in need. For example, in 2020, over 40 ecclesial groups participated in our Bags of Love initiative, which saw over 800 sleeping bags distributed to shelters and those without a home. If you, your ecclesia, or CYC want to learn more and get involved with our latest initiative, please visit our website at www.thegardenoutreach.org. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The Garden Outreach for the latest news and encouragement. And now, here's the show. Welcome back to the show, Laura. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to to talk with you. Um, it's been a little, I guess, a little less than a year because we definitely talked at the beginning of COVID. I think it was sometime in August, maybe, <laughs> maybe six months ago. <laughs> I feel like time is so relative during a pandemic. Oh, yeah. It's how, like Groundhog Day. How has life been? Are you... You're still in school, right? You're yep. finishing you're in the middle of a semester right now? Yep, I am still in school. Technically, I'm a senior in university. I am doing a major and a minor, so I'm actually going to be staying till next May. So I'll be doing five years of university, and I, it's interesting online. Um, but it was just announced yesterday, fingers yeah. crossed, that next semester we'll be going back 80% in person because we're in a small area. So who knows? Wow. <laughs> That's a much better experience. And um, how is the channel going? So you you had kind of a relaunch? Yeah. So I was really strong in my Faithfully Lori account until like September-ish, September 2020, until like October-ish, um, because I was doing great in the first part of quarantine, I felt very happy, very calm. Um, not, I didn't feel a lot of pressure from the pandemic. School adjusted to online pretty seamlessly. They kind of downsized on the amount of work that they expected from us. And then summer was great because I was right. with my family. Like it was just a good time. Um, but then it really hit when fall 2020 semester came. And they expected us to be on Zoom all day, every day, basically, which most of the world is facing, at least here in the United States. And that was really a challenge for me. And I live by myself. So I was by myself like all the time. So I got a dog, which is wonderful. Love my dog. But it was really challenging at first. So <laughs> everything just felt challenging. Yeah. And Instagram and anything like that felt like work felt like I was starting to care about likes. I was starting to care not about the message and it just was doing more damage than good. Mm -hmm. So I just stopped. I just deleted Instagram. Mm -hmm. I just didn't do anything because I felt like I, I was being asked too much from every part of my life. So I kind of like shut down okay. and, and I had to deal with a lot of mental health issues but I've been working through those and I've come to a better place where I feel like social media is where I want to be again because I see how much hope it brings me and how much hope it brings uh, my friends through that. Do you feel like it aligned with the season? Like you kind of entered the fall, things got cold, mm -hmm. anything like that? Oh, yeah. I am somebody that deals ha and has dealt my entire life with anxiety and depression. Um, it's very genetic in my family as well. And I was here last year for like a true fall and a true winter. Um, seasonal depression is a real thing. <laughs> I, think it yeah. I think it was part of the season, but it was also, I had left my family again. I wasn't living at John's family's house anymore because I, um, his family very graciously let me stay there during the first part of quarantine. 
Um, but now I moved back to my apartment where I'm by myself. So it was just like, I was on my computer. It was dark outside. I was by myself and it was just lonely. Yeah, it was a huge challenge and it was hard even through winter, through the snow and everything. That's why I said before the recording started is I'm doing great today because the sun's out. Like that's not right. very rare. <laughs> right. So it, it, it doesn't look like you ever took like a formal full on break, but you kind of were posting every 10 days or two weeks for a yeah. while instead of kind of like your regular pace now is two or three times a week. Right. Yeah, exactly. So like I, I, for, I feel like for a while I was, I might've been a little bit long in attendees. Like it felt like I wasn't on there ever. Um, where previously I was always right. interacting with some, like some followers. I was always in the comments. I was always in the uh, messages. I was talking to people, right. like a lot of conversation was sparked around my posts and then it just went silent. Cause I just wasn't doing as much. People weren't as interested, which is totally fine because I just didn't have the capacity for it. Right. But now I feel, feel like I have the capacity again to preach in this way. Yeah. Cool. And how's it going lately? It's been going pretty good. I think for me, friendships and relationships are huge. Mm -hmm. um, they drive my every move, basically. <laughs> and right. so just a few weeks ago, an older brother in the Ecclesia, so his daughters are my age, he reached out to me and asked if we could have a phone call to kind of talk about Christadelphians and their relationships to Christians and how mm -hmm. I've made that journey. And that, and just that individual reaching out to me and from a place of like true love, just wanting to hear how I am because I've like shared some pretty vulnerable things on Instagram and telling me that they really like to like see me on Instagram again. And then it brings like hope to them. That's, that is why I do this. This is, and that fills my cup up and makes me feel like I can continue going. So that's been really helpful. Right we talked about it kind of in our first the first episode that we did it was in august i think it's really neat that you've kind of um you know you've taken bible study bible marking kind of just basically spending time with your bible and and you know really treated that message for as the general message it is right you have a specific theology in christadelphia same as mine right but mm -hmm. you've you're kind of just happy to kind of speak to the you know the basics right yeah mm -hmm. the good stuff I was going to say, I remember you, you, you talked about sharing something um, personal. And I, I just think that that picture of you holding your prescriptions in your Bible at the same time is so awesome. It was really striking kind of when it happened. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder if that was like her best. Like, I wonder if, you know, you got a lot of feedback because I think that's interesting when you are when you are kind of genuine, you know, then you are producing better, you know, quote unquote content. Your post right before it was like twice, <clears throat> double the size as far as likes. Yeah. Which was your resolutions one yeah i don't even remember that one um but i do remember <laughs> i do remember posting that one about the medications because that was hard to do so but i'm yeah. really, i'm really passionate about voicing these things the things yes. that are almost taboo and almost and and just kind of pushed under the rug a little bit this was a very mm -hmm. vulnerable post for me because a lot of people know me as someone who's very passionate, someone who's very loving and, and happy. But I have to work really, really hard to be that way because um, I'm naturally inclined to be in more of a depressed state and um, very, very anxious. So mm -hmm. I, for so long, so long, probably should have been on medication. People, my, right. my parents had been talking to me. My grandparents had been talking to me. My closest friends had been telling me, Laura, you need some help. Like this, if you were to break a bone, you'd get a cast. Your mental health right. is no different. But I was so scared because because I've even heard the argument that you're not faithful if you're not faithful if you have to rely on medication. Jesus doesn't love that. Like things, those really negative things went and, and it hurt me. Um, and I could have been so much better off if I had just been on medication earlier. So I decided to post about how yeah. medication does not define your faith because I'm taking antidepressant medication. And so, and really that was helpful for me not to find shame in it either. 
And my greatest hope is that just someone will see that and down the line, if they do need medication, they'll be like, you know what? Like, I know that there's people in the Christadelphian community that are on it and it is not, it is not defining of my faith. Right. No, I think it's, it it is a fraught issue for people. They think that like, it's some sort of admission of weakness and it's kind of like, again, you know, I don't know, it's not there that you have to separate the idea of your mental health being strength or like, or some sort of betterment of person, you know, like it's funny because we don't mind, like, I guess we recognize it. Like when some, like someone is, you know, an amazing athlete and has this ridiculous, you know, muscular structure or like, you know, that doesn't actually qualify them as a better person anyway. <laughs> it's like, it, you know, we don't, I don't think we have a problem making that connection and make or keeping that disconnected. Does that make sense? Yeah. But like, we do have that issue with like when someone might say that, you know, they struggle with mental health. Exactly. And that is something that I find a challenge. And I know so many of my friends find a challenge as well is that there's this stigma around mental health and you're almost afraid to talk about it because you don't want your peers and you don't want your ecclesia. You don't want the people around you to view you any differently. Um, And it really shouldn't be about that because honestly, I'm in a better place to serve God than I was without medication because previously I had no capacity for him. It was worry, stress, anxiety, all those things. And just wanting to lay in bed, couldn't get out of bed. Those things were consuming my life, taking medication and letting it work for a few months kind of set me free from those things. So that now I'm in a place to use that time differently where I would have been in bed and just like sleeping and couldn't get out. Right of that cycle, but now I'm able to wake up in the mornings, get out of bed, start my morning study and pray. And, and I'm, and I'm right. able to get into the habit of God again. And I wasn't able to do that before. Right. In a way you're more like trustworthy or someone that people can actually lean on or responsible now, right. Mm-hmm. That you're taking medication than before. Yeah. Yeah, which that that would be, I would say, a, a definition of strength in a way, right? Like I would say, I trust the, the people who are the strongest that I know. You know, for some of us, you need that medication to reach that kind of le- that trustworthy level, right? That useful yeah. level for to people. And I think that that's a is a topic that I'm really sad that isn't talked about more because the people that do struggle with mental health issues really need the love and support from right. the in that time and. And a lot of the time it's not given. And I'm very blessed that it was given in my situation, but I know people that it is just not there. I'm glad you're in a much better place now. I'm glad you're feeling good. And I'm glad you're back, back on the channel. I think it's a big, I'm a big fan of it and of, uh, of what you're doing. Do you have any kind of plans for the next couple of months with Faithfully Laura? I kind of launched an Etsy store along with it just um, so that I can, just survive. (laughs) But I really, I mean, I have like exciting Etsy store things coming up, which I'm looking forward to. That's cool. No, yeah. Yeah. It is exciting for me. And then I think just mostly, um, like I was talking to my mom today about Bible study and how sometimes we can put bigger pressures on ourselves to do this massive study, all like do all three Bible readings to the Robert Roberts plan. Like it can feel really overwhelming. So I think my goal is to stop apologizing for the fact that I'm not like in a lot of my posts, I say, I didn't get as much done as I wanted to. Like I just degrade myself a little bit, but instead Uh I'm going to really try working on allowing myself to be happy with the progress that I've made, allowing myself to be like, you know what? I was really struggling to want to open my Bible today. And I'm really happy that I just read a chapter and kind of sat with it for a while. Like that's better than I would have done. And so kind of removing that intimidation and pressure from study and Bible reading is my goal to just make it a more approachable and sustainable activity. Yeah, just kind of constantly reducing that self pressure we put on ourselves. Yeah, exactly. That's this road for sure. That's exciting. We love love the Etsy store. I think that's great that you're doing that too. It's good for people. Yeah. We're talking about Laura's Instagram account, which is at faithfully Laura, and uh, the link for the Etsy account is there. Well, so the second conversation we wanted to have was kind mm-hmm. of about young people in the church. So you you talked about being a senior. You, are you 22 or how old are you now? I'm 21. Because I have friends in the Ecclesia and friends through university. Yeah. And across the board, a lot of us 
in a sense, I don't know how to say it other than like soul searching, like trying to figure out <laughs> what we stand for, what our morals are, what we're going to align ourselves with, who we're going to align ourselves with. And so I think it's a lot of, and especially in the pandemic, it's a lot of like clearing out the baggage and bringing in better habits, at least in the groups that I'm with. And I can see that a lot with my friends um, at school who are practicing Christians, but are kind of trying to figure out what truth is. They're going through that journey. I'm going through my mental health journey. I think just mainly everyone's going on a journey and it is so different for everyone, but we're all trying to just feel safe and comfortable through it all. (laughs) Honestly, I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a strange, it's such a strange time. It's weird. Uh, I, I feel strange about this last year, just like living through history and knowing that this will affect, you know, the rest of your life, like having experienced this. And I think it's gotta be so confusing. I know it's confusing for my other friends, your age, where like, you're kind of doing your own talk about like your own journey, but also the world is experiencing, you know, this whole, a whole other level of stuff. And it's like, what is yours and what is what's your own head and what's the whole world, you know, it's hard to, dif- hard to draw those lines. And I'm scared. Like I am scared through this pandemic because I'm going through school for um, being early childhood and special education teacher. Right. So that means with everything that's going on with the pandemic, the classroom is never going to be the same. So I right. signed up to be a teacher in what it used to be. So I am having to, in the middle of my studies, have to learn all these new things about virtual school and and how to do everything virtually. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the classroom is not going to be the same. So I am scared. (laughs) So I can really relate to people that are unsure about like where they're going professionally as well. Because like, I know I want to be a teacher, but I did not sign up to be a teacher in a pandemic world where students can't even share the same supplies. So it's just an added challenge that is kind of overwhelming that kind of just hits you all the time. Yeah, it's exactly right. It's just hard to for- It's hard to forget, you know, the mm-hmm. times that we're living in when you're, you know, on your own journey. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Do you think there's a difference between like the world at large and kind of the Christelphian sub community or what do you think? I'm not sure there's much of a difference because what I see is that everyone's getting tired. Everyone is just so tired of it. Like people in the ecclesia, like it's just starting to, the the pandemic's really starting to grate on everyone. If we think about it, it's been almost a year and I think people are really starting to be annoyed. (laughs) And I see that like at school, people are starting to be like, you know what, I'm just going to expand my bubble a little bit more. Like this is ridiculous. Like I need friendships. I'm going crazy. And I think that's starting to kind of happen as well. So everyone's just trying, everyone's trying to maintain sanity is I think the way to put it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That that's, I think that's universal. Do you think the challenges like now are different from the, from six months ago in the, or again, like specifically for young people or. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say motivations even harder than it was yeah. before motivation to do anything motivation to even just get on zoom for your classes is so hard. Like it uses basically all your motivation for the whole day. And mm-hmm. then as a young person, <laughs> having to have that self-discipline to say, you know what, I'm going to also spend time with God today. Like it's Mm -hmm. not natural. It's uncomfortable because you're just being pulled in so many directions. It's just like work, school, virtual, everything, virtual meeting. You're not even with your ecclesia. And so how it's, it's a hard to imagine how all of us are going to leave this spiritually unscathed Mm -hmm. uh, because it, I think that was a problem I also had was that it's hard to stay motivated when you don't have your, your ecclesia with you. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed it at the, uh, I taught the, um, I'm kind of in a point of teaching a lot of things just recently, but I I was at the Cambridge CYC weekend and I did a couple of the classes there and that was, and it was great, but um, I'm, I'm on zoom maybe a couple hours a day. And it's not, it's the different schedule every day. You know, it's just random kind of meetings. But when I get on there, it's like 
you know, you guys are professionals, right? You're doing it all day long yeah, and it's, ter- and it's, it's, <laughs> it's frustrating that your spirit, you know, ideally a COIC weekend would be a highlight, you know, for an, in anyone's kind of calendar. Um, mm-hmm. But, but that was, it's just another zoom event, you know, in yeah. your full event of zoom calendars. It's, exactly. it's frustrating that school and church feel the same, right? Exactly. And, and exactly. Oh my thing. goodness. Exactly. And I'm sorry to say, but here at Pittsburgh, we didn't start our CYC up until literally like two weeks ago because none of us had the motivation to do it this past year because there's no lot like we like I'm sure everyone's calling like Zoom fatigue. Like I'm on Zoom like eight hours a day some days and it's ridiculous. And then on the weekends, it's like, oh, there's a CYC weekend but I'm having trouble getting the motivation to go to it because I was just on zoom for full time. Oh, <laughs> so right. it's, it's, right. it's finding your way through that. And, and the way that I found my way through it is just, this might sound like silly, but like literally just making yourself do it. Like I put my foot down and we're like, guys, we're meeting CYC this time, be there or not. <laughs> like we're doing right, it. Right, right. It's, it's a matter of just telling yourself, You just have to tell yourself, it's going to be good. Just go and do it. It's going to be good. Don't think about it now. Just go and do it. And it was wonderful. We spent two hours on Zoom just like showing each other funny pictures, doing the Bible readings, just laughing. And that was exactly what we needed. But it was so hard to get the energy and motivation to do it. But it was so rewarding. Yeah. I don't know. That's good. I'm glad to hear that it was good. I think there is kind of a a new, I feel like there is a a little bit of a newer zoom phase. Like we're just, we are all really adjusted to it. You know, like we do, we do know how to relax a little bit on it, but it's still, it's just obviously not as good as being in in actual contact with each other. What do you think the summer will be like coming up? Do you have any plans or any hopes or dreams, I guess? I got a wonderful job here in Slipper Rock, Pennsylvania at an environmental center on campus. So that means that I have a summer job opportunity to work here, which is really great. But what's equally as great is that they have told me that I can do three weeks virtual and two weeks off completely. So that means five weeks in California, which is such a blessing. I'm counting my blessings in that that sense. Um, So I get to go home to California, which is a huge blessing. And... um, I think it's, who knows, it's so different in California than it is here. So I don't know how much we'll be allowed to do, but last summer I would have my friends over and we would sit get across the pool from each other, totally social distance. And I really can't wait to do that again because I wasn't home for long enough in winter to do that. Yeah. Um, so I think just trying to reach as many people as I can while being socially distant is kind of going to be my goal. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so hopeful for Idlewild. Um, oh, yeah. I heard about yeah. that. Which is Bible. That's our Bible school in Southern California. That's how Laura and I really know each other, basically. But I just hope, hope, hope we get enough people to get the vaccine and cases get under control. And that would just feel amazing to have a, yeah. a Bible school this summer. That I, I agree. So just this past week, my sister, Emma, who lives in New York now, mm-hmm. she texted me like Tuesday night. So it's third. It's Friday today. So on Tuesday night, she texted me and said, Hey, what are you doing tomorrow? And I was like, um, nothing. <laughs> and she said, um, okay, I'm going to come visit you. And it was like Wednesday in the next day. So on Wednesday night, Emma came over and it was really nice because she's vaccinated. And I unfortunately had COVID in like November. So I've already had COVID. Um, okay. And so it was like just having that relaxed feeling that we felt like a little bit of security because she's vaccinated and I have some sort of immunity to it for now. It felt so nice to just be with other people. So I can only look forward to what it's going to be like in summertime. Mm-hmm. And even if Idlewild is not going to look the same, because it can't look the same, but right. we're going to be in a place, us Californians who know and love the place will be there. Oh man, smell the yeah, pine hopefully. trees. <laughs> everyone who, go, who usually goes to Idlewild, come on. <laughs> yeah, it, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> We just, uh, you know, prayer that, uh, uh, keep praying that things continue to get better. Yeah. And I think through it all, it is very 
it's just tumultuous. It's very up and down. It's completely unpredictable. And as a young person, that's very challenging because I can speak for a lot of young people in the sense is that we're kind of frustrated and we're upset because in, in a way, like these are your best, like you hear it all the time from older people, like these are your best years. And like, this is so hard to be away from other young people, away from those friendships that are so crucial, especially for young people that might be kind of confused um, on where they're supposed to be spiritually and right. they're kind of on the fence. Relationships a lot of the time hold people together. Right. And totally. we're dealing with being separated from our friends. So from the ecclesia, it's just so important to kind of foster a really warm and loving approach to kind of cultivate warmth in your ecclesia so that people feel welcome and that they want to come to zoom because realistically those that are on zoom all the time don't want to go to zoom but we go because we know it's right and because we want to see our brothers and sisters but it's challenging when on zoom like we all have our bad days but if it's consistently every week not a warm environment people are going to feel distant. And so it's I just, think that's somewhere we could work on. It's too easy to not, to not log in. Yes, the oh, yeah. Self-discipline. Yeah. That could be the banner of the year is self-discipline. <laughs> yeah. You're saying that a thing that Ecclesias can do is try to make these experiences warmer somehow, more inviting yes. for people to log in. Exactly. Because, and this kind of branches to something that I did want to talk about was as a young person, something that I desperately would want to see and need to see in the ecclesia is warmth because Mm -hmm. not just like for my own benefit, but because I am in a situation where I have friends that I could easily be inviting to meeting. Yeah. It's easier than ever. (laughs) Yeah. It's easier than ever, but I, I'm sorry to say that I'm very hesitant. I'm very yeah. hesitant because it's a lot of the times it's not all that warm. And I'm not just talking about my ecclesias. It's like, it's, if you know what I'm trying to say, it's just like, I'm, I'm hesitating to invite my friends because I'm worried about what their opinions are going to be, which is totally not what we're supposed to be feeling, but we've have a bit of a culture where there's a lot of guilt, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot Mm -hmm. of um, expectations. And so me as a young person, I have these opportunities to be inviting people to experience the truth with us, but I'm hesitating. So I just like try to sit with the question of like, why, why am I hesitating? Mm. What do you think? Why are you hesitating? I think, I think I'm worried about what their opinion is going to be because I know it's truth and I know they're looking for truth, but I hesitate because of culture and tradition. And, and I, and I'm not hesitating because of what we believe I'm hesitating because of how we interact with one another. Yeah. We have a community that is usually very in and out kind of focused. Um, It's called, some people call it a high barrier community. And while I do think God draws lines and there is light and there is darkness, there's spiritual concepts that would lead us to believe of being in God's family or out of God's family. Mm -hmm. There's still, there's so much that we can do to lower that barrier and make it very clear that, that everybody is valued because everybody is valued by God. Right. And Mm -hmm. that's the, that's, I think the, the perception that we can have or that that can be made from our, uh, from how our community reacts and what one even way i mean there's some that's just out of convenience like you know if you show up at some random zoom right now you you might get the question hey where are you from you know what Mm -hmm. what ecclesia are you from and it's like well while that's a useful question because we're trying to make a human connection with someone that we don't know we're trying to you know quickly build kind of a idea of who they are in our head it 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 can be kind of a lazy question i'm not going to say dangerous it's not dangerous but that was the word that came in my head because you're if that person doesn't know the answer right they don't speak our lang our like yeah. specific community language you know then they're made to feel uncomfortable yeah and i and and specifically 
I think, so I try to imagine what would happen if I were to bring my friends to meeting on Zoom. I try to sit there and be like, okay, how would this go down? Um, well, first off, I love, I'm somebody who's very comfortable with tradition. I, I was raised that way. I'm comfortable with it. Um, but there's certain things that it's just uncomfortable for someone who wasn't raised in that tradition and so I try to imagine like how the flow between like Sunday school to memorial service would be and how it is after memorial service and after memorial service a lot of people I would say would not be like oh Laura who's this you brought with you and be like oh Laura like have introduced your friend to us um at least that's not what I in the collegiates I regular visit regularly visit that I I hesitate to think that's what's going to actually happen so I just feel a little I don't know I'm trying to talk about this very gently because I don't want to like offend anyone but it's a very real problem is that yeah, it's a ch- and there's a challenge I think there's a real challenge to what to do about it you know mm-hmm. especially while you're on zoom um you know but I think there is language that we can be aware of um and I think yeah your content also you know avoiding I, I, like you're saying, I'm also someone who's aware and comfortable with our traditions. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's some words, you know, some words that can be avoided. And yeah. there's efforts you can take. Like, I, I do think it's interesting on Zoom how, like, even in crowds, like, you have to acknowledge people when they when they log on, you know, mm-hmm. to build that community or that welcoming. Otherwise, people feel like they're not they're not there. Yeah. You know? And you could easily like turn your camera off, put it across the room and be on your phone during a yeah. service. Like it's so easy, but I think what would be really helpful in this situation is just to give people some call to action, some, some resources or tips that you can do instead. And from somebody that wants to bring their friend, you know, it would be really helpful would be if you, when you got onto zoom, were like, Hey, like talk to one person a week, try to say, Hey, Levi, how was your week before Sunday school? Maybe just say that. And then you could say like a quick talk and maybe switch it up every week and make sure you stay on after meeting and search the Zoom boxes and see if anyone's new or different. Or if someone looks a little sad, be like, hey, so-and-so, is your week going great? Or are you struggling a little bit? Like, let's talk about that. And something that the Verdugo Hills Ecclesia does that um, is very good is that they have, and I don't know if any other ecclesias are doing it, but they have breakout rooms after meeting for, to build more fellowship. And I think that that's a really positive step forward and something that we can be doing is um, to just try to build the community a little bit more. So I know that I'm going to try to go back to my Ecclesia here and be like, you know what, let's try to build this comfort because I want you guys to know that I'm going to bring my friends soon. And I want this to be an environment that they want to be in rather than a little bit scared of. Yeah, I've been to an ecclesia that does that breakout room thing. And I really like it because it's it's kind of interesting. They do like they did like multiple rounds, like seven minute breakout rooms. And you come back and if you want to keep hanging out, you're gonna you're gonna get randomly into another oh, one. Oh, that's nice. And yeah, see, those are people, people kind of drop out in between, but it was still it was still nice because you're in now there's only four screens. It's a much yeah. more manageable conversation. Yeah, see that's that's a good way to put it is a manageable conversation. Is that and a lot of introverts feel like Zoom's the death of them because it's like, oh my gosh, that is so many people I have to talk to, but it can be manageable. So I think us as an ecclesia can really be doing positive things to foster happiness and warmth. And that's what I think young people need is that encouragement to Mm -hmm. stay connected because even I needed that encouragement when they did the breakout rooms, because I get kind of uncomfortable sometimes in those situations. So my parents had to be like, Laura, stay for the breakout room. I was like, okay. And then, and then, and then I stayed and I really liked it. So we just need that push. And, and like right now we're generating ideas that are very practical that you can bring back to your Ecclesia. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's good. And I think, yeah, just being, having an inclusive mind is so critical for us, especially cross-generationally as well. Yeah. Anything else you thought of that uh, that you would want to like? What would you want to tell kind of older members? You know, some listener here who is feeling like, how do I connect with the younger people in my ecclesia? Right? What would you tell them? So I'm doing the Faith Watch program, and I okay. really, really love it. And something I really love out of it is the mentor program. Um, mm-hmm. I got to choose a mentor, and thankfully, I and I'm very 
happy to say that I chose a mentor that I've known my entire life. So mm-hmm. I, I already had that relationship there. And so I think something that we, that isn't really done very much anymore is a mentor program is to be paired Mm. up with someone you genuinely trust and someone that's kind of outside of your family situation and really close relationships that kind of has an outside view in and is able to keep you grounded and is kind of a sounding board for you. So already it's been helpful for me and I'm really looking forward to the um, beneficial topics that we'd like to discuss together. And I think that is something that young people and elderly people can pursue. So like the older people in the Ecclesia, you can go up to someone and say, Hey, if you're ever interested in a mentor, I'd really, I'm available to be that if you're looking for it, because both of us, both sides need someone to take a step forward because elderly people don't really have that bridge and young people don't really always have that bridge. So just having the willingness to put yourself out there a little bit and even just say to the whole Klesia, if you're looking for a mentor, go to so-and-so. And that is, I didn't realize how much I needed that mentor figure in my life because I have my parents, I have my boyfriend, I have my boyfriend's parents, I have my close friends, but I'm very close relationships with all of them. And if I have problems, it's usually from one of those relationships. <laughs> and so I needed someone outside who had the same beliefs as me right. that can really ground me and ground on my decision making and help me make a godly decision. And so that was a really, that's a really beneficial change that I've made that I really encourage other people to do as well. Mentorship. I would say for one practical point, I agree with you that someone needs to take a step forward. It is also super easy for an ecclesia to set up like a matchmaker mm-hmm. yeah. and, and that's so much easier. Like we're going to start a mentorship program, submit your name, right? Yeah, exactly. And they make those matches and then you're both kind of told instead of someone having to volunteer. But someone brought that up to me kind of like, and actually the tidings is right now on their website, they're doing a, um, a poll, whether you, whether spiritual mentorship like existed for you. And I, I think it's absolutely kind of how I survived kind of post high school life spiritually is having, having a whole now unrelated adult that I could talk to and yeah, like exactly like you're saying, just no other association, no other relationships besides our faith relationship and this mentorship relationship. So then you can talk about like the other relationships in your life. Yeah, exactly. And it's really, I think, especially in pandemic times, it's very valuable. Yeah, that's a good point. Cause all kind of all you can do is talk to people anyways. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Did you have any other things to tell that person who wants to know what to do? I think the best thing I've done for myself is to, if things are feeling too overwhelming, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It doesn't have to be a Bible readings, Bible study. Your faith with God is not meant to be a burden. Instead, God says that our burden is light he takes, he takes that pressure off our shoulders. And, and so us having this relationship with personal time with God being really overwhelming, it doesn't have to be. And so kind of analyzing why it's overwhelming, trying to get to the root of that. And even as backwards as it sounds, even scaling back a little bit, because if you're signing on for too much of yourself, you're not going to make a lot of steps forward. So for example, I was doing too much. I was expecting myself to do all three Bible readings a day. I was expecting myself to do some book study plus a little bit of personal study and I gave up. And so instead I did nothing, but now I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do one reading today and really sit with it and just And just soak it up and pray about it and just figure that out. And it's a lot less and a lot more manageable. So instead of wearing so many hats, just put on one hat and you're able to kind of walk a little smoother and feel a lot lighter. Yeah, that's a good message. I think that's, uh, again, imagining that if you're an an older person that wants to help a younger person too, that might be a, that's a worthwhile conversation, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, don't, don't try to take over the world right now you know? Yep. And I think, I think just each, 
I do think it's helpful for people who have lived a longer time to say like, Hey, this is unlike a time I've ever lived through either. Yeah. You know, like, just so you know, <laughs> like yeah. I was saying this to, uh, I was actually talking to, um, a, a young lady girl, uh, she was 12 and she said to me, why is everyone talking about politics so much? And it was like a week after the riot at the Capitol. Mm-hmm. We'll call her Sally. I said, Sally, I want you to understand that that was a historic event. Like we've ne- history has never seen anything yeah. like it. And it's in the middle of a historic event. Like history has kind of seen pandemics before, but not anytime kind of recently. Like you're experiencing something that no one has experienced. Like you're used to being 12, right? And assuming that adults know what's going on. And yeah. it's like, we don't, you know, no one knows what really what's going on right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, exactly. No one, no one has lived this before. And I think that's helpful for older people to be saying to younger people, you know, just admitting yeah. that, being vulnerable about that. I would completely agree. Yeah. I think it's valuable to be vulnerable with the people that are close to you, especially those that need your support in your walk of faith. Right. Well, thank you, Laura. This was a great conversation. Thanks. Thanks for so much time. Um, Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm really happy that I was able to come back again.